decision, you know, we'll have to figure out who's most appropriate for making them happen. But I think unless you put it down as a list, so who wants to, who's got a pen and paper? We're doing it right now. Okay. We, Make it happen. Okay, so you want to or you have to make these more places. Um, I think that as curators, we should all be taking more risks and probably doing more research that extends beyond um, the people and faces that we might already be aware of, uh, both here and internationally. Um, because I feel like we've been talking a lot about, uh, you know, emerging artists and new ideas and ways that we, you know, talking about how throwing crumbs at them and giving us um, even more opportunities would help, but I think also putting more of a focus on those people and on those new ideas is also really important. Also, I think that we've talked a lot about um, sort of this idea of like maybe bringing um, more focus on Portland by um, having more of an international focus. And I think fundamentally, whether or not it's an international focus or one on the local art, art, artists here, I think we just need to like have more in-depth criticism. Um, all of us should be doing that more. I think that that's one way that we can avoid the shock of the new, also. Um, if we do some more follow-up and follow-through. So yeah, research and criticism. Actually, I guess. I'm sorry if this is dense, but I, we said about Mark Rothko was going to be interesting to me. In terms of bringing more attention to Portland and how that relates to his lack of attention as an intellectual and moving on to being an artist. How does bringing more attention and finance to a Portland art scene nurture the inevitability of a career of a successful artist? I feel like sometimes those two things are unrelated. Right. Yeah, it, it, that's part of that's part of the that's part of the whole um, that's part of the whole uh, magic of being an artist and making things happen. It, it's like how you connect those dots. Is it important to? It's, it's, it's very important to connect the dots, but everybody has to do it their own way and figure it out. You know, you know, do you meet Urban Bloom and he gives you your first show in Los Angeles and you know it. it, it, it all those sorts of things have happened in the past, and those models have changed. Yeah. So you got to you got to make your own path. Each well, way. before you, you would think of a successful artist like something who would just like go to a gallery and sell money painting and make millions, and it's over. It's not a hard enough yet. That's it. You know. So the success is you know how can you create a community around you? How can you live with your art? How can you like plant the seed that will put you in art history? But like success as financial means, that's it, it's, it's gone. It's not gonna happen because it's too expensive and no gallery wanna take a risk. And if they do, they will do it for six months and they will give them a, a bunch of money and you go and retire, that's it. And no one do that. It's you wanna keep doing your art, you know. So yeah. so we need to think of how we can sort of like accommodate the new model of artists which work around creators <coughs> and communities and cities and biennale and festival, you know, instead of like trying to project somebody to go into a gallery and show and be a star, you know, it's not gonna happen. Yeah, I mean, I mean what you're really getting at too is this uh, moment in which we are, <coughs> excuse me, I'm probably talking too well, uh, the moment in which we are living where we have more and more people going to art schools and more and more people sort of entering the market, but fewer and fewer collectors actually with this sort of shrinking economy. Um, hedge funds aren't investing in art as much as they used to. Um, or dead artists. And, right, <laughs> and so you have this, this a little bit of a, you know, a bottleneck that's actually occurring, maybe not a little bit, you actually have a pretty severe bottleneck that's occurring. And I think it's the institutions, the educational institutions either need to start training artists to also be plumbers, or we need to figure out ways in which one can be successful in, in monetarily within the arts that isn't through, just through gallery systems, because you can't live off grants, that's for sure. Um, in, it doesn't work necessarily to just sort of float around through residencies. Um, I mean, there's these interesting things you're bringing up around how does one 
move from the institutions, the education of institutions, or even from one's own studio to a level of monetary success. Yeah, the, the arts are, are, are a war of attrition, and it's almost like you, you hang around long enough to eventually, at some point, you might make a little money at it, and maybe if you're really lucky, you make a lot of money at it, but maybe it's, Really, it, really, it, really, you, really lucky. But you want to, a lot of it, it's more how, how do you hang in there and just get better at what you do. And it's sort of like you take care of your shop, and then hopefully something else takes care of you. That thing. I, uh, I may be wrong, but I think that there is a connection between uh, writers and writing about art and then collectors that will figure out the galleries or institutions and so So I feel like there needs to be a more inclusive and a broader reach in terms of the shows that actually get written about. Um, you know, I own the papers or I read the blogs and it's the same galleries over and over and over again. And I begin to wonder, you know, why is that? Is it, is it um, a lack in the actual Is it um, a statement of the, the lack of voice? So I don't think that's it. I think that if we want to, if you keep saying that there are there are, there are new people moving into Portland with mm -hmm. money, um, but if they are collectors that are not being told where to go and see art, then that art is not going to be purchased. Um, yeah. As a gallerist, again, you know, it's it's hard for me to convince somebody from outside of Portland to come show if you can't guarantee some sort of success. Right. Well, uh, it's right. true. A lot of, uh, I, speaking as, I don't know how many critics are in this room, it's really tough to find, oh, there's Patrick as well. He's in front of me. He's a critic. The guy standing right in front of me, well, underneath you, he's a critic. Uh, but uh, critics are incredibly rare animals. They're really tough to find. They're, and none of them, nobody goes, to school and says, I'm going to graduate and become an art critic. It just doesn't happen that way. It's just a, a really rough road to hoe. Yeah, I understand. And, and, and I, I think that's... that's I'm curious, like, so why aren't there more critics? And, it, and I think the real trick is, is that you want critics who feel like they need to get out and see a lot of shows. I don't... I'd like no, to see more people yeah, travel. You, you are absolutely right. We need more, more critics in Portland. And, and we need more. And they need to see more shows, the ones that we do have. That's always a big thing. And we need more information. We need more newspaper, more blogs, you know, and uh, more critics. Because, yeah, you're right. If the collector, the collector, they want to play safe, you know, unless you are a very adventurous collector, you know. So, so and how do you get into being an adventurous collector? You don't. You're not made immediately. You usually kind of wade in a little bit, and you're suddenly like, "Oh, I like this, and I like to be challenged." And so then you become an adventurous collector. So uh, you need to have. It's true. You want to have more gateways. And then the reason this really quick for you. The reason that you don't have more critics is that a, there's no money in it. Like <sighs> nobody really pays. I mean, like and people maybe you. maybe the Mercury will give you fifty bucks to write a review if you're lucky. Um, you're going to be in the Should really spend some time looking at the broader scene. I just feel that. Well, it's you know, hard. You galleries like Elizabeth Lee. Right, it's hard. to say that they don't deserve. Because, yeah. you know, right, they, do, they do have their preferences, you know. They do have like, right. their own aesthetic that they would right. want exactly. to promote, you know. So well, they would go to those the places paper. where they find that. You know? Yeah, a lot of people yeah. really don't understand critics. And, you know, I can explain that to you. There's a lot of writers don't want, they want their words to matter. And they're writing not necessarily because they, 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 they write because they like to write. And they find some work that they feel might be around longer that gives them ideas to write about. So they're writing about maybe something at uh, one or just maybe three different venues because they feel like there's permanence there. And if they write about a bunch of nobodies, then their work, uh, their work as a writer might be worth nothing in the future. Because we all have egos, right? So even the critics want their words to matter, right? Just like the painters want their paintings to matter. It's rough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tori, I think. Oh, well, I think along with that, I think the artists, art institutions, independent galleries, whatever have you, should be more responsible about putting out press materials that are legible and that can reach a wider audience and they're not fucking erudite and don't make sense to anybody except for the artists and people that, you know, 
wrote that. Yeah, totally. Because I mean, we all know that we, I mean, I think we've all up here written criticism and things. And you know, it's like if you have something that you can like really reference and really get a sense from and get a good quote out of, I mean, that's invaluable. Yeah, and, and uh, Tori works for me, and she gets the calendar stuff, so she gets tons and tons of press releases, so she definitely knows what she's talking about, uh, just to share that information. Um, one thing I think that we should have is we need to figure out a way to have suitcase funds for artists who have opportunities elsewhere in order to, for them to go there. More than racks, travel grants? Like, like, well, I mean, like, we so we have some of that, right? I mean, we have racks, travel grants. Yeah. So, like, where, 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 right, in the range, right. right. So, like, what else? Like, how much? I mean, what, what, what mechanisms? We have some of that. Well, it's a little bit, but it's not as good as like what Milwaukee, Wisconsin has. And Mary Knowles, intensely wealthy person, set up something where basically they have three or four local curators. And they have some money that they can use each year that, uh, that is funded through some funding source. And up to them, they can decide, hey, uh, you've got this great thing happening in Tulsa, and you'd love to be able to go there, but you can't. And everybody knows it's a good thing. The timing on it is too short to get a RAP grant. Right. And that's the sort of travel yeah, yeah. suitcase fund that I'm talking about. And actually, it's like an emergency art fund. Yeah, and I brought uh, an artist back in 2005 out for the Fresh Trouble show and Doug Holst from Milwaukee using a Mary Noel Travel Fund grant. And it, it struck me, it was like, yeah, I can bring somebody from Milwaukee out here, but I couldn't bring somebody from Portland to Milwaukee because there wasn't a similar thing. This is kind of loaded. They could bring up this point in the conversation, but uh, it's something I've been thinking all evening uh, as part of this larger conversation, and that is, do you think that the city of Portland takes for granted the fact that there's so many creative people here, so they don't support it as much as they might because it's like, oh, they're going to come here for the beer and weed. Yeah, <laughs> that's true, but it's true of any place. But it's it's definitely, I think there's so many of us here that they very much take it for granted. I, I, it's why I sometimes, you know. I'm not a cranky person, uh, but I, I put on a good show of being cranky sometimes just to rattle people up over at the various granting organizations just because I'm like, I want you to know I'm a little unhappy because I've never actually gotten a grant in Portland and I've been here for 13 years. And it's, uh, I don't understand it, but it happens. I've gotten money from grant, uh, RAP, though. Uh, uh, other ways, so, uh, other institutions have written the grants and it's come to me. So it's, but personally writing a grant, nothing. Maybe it's because I'm a critic and I make a point of pissing people off, and maybe that's you know just part of my situation. Uh, that is a choice I made. But you know, that's where professionalism comes into it. Yeah. I think we need two more questions. I don't ever want this to stop. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. I, just, I have a question, uh, like kind of skirting around the collector issue, the collector bases, and then, you know, there hasn't been much discussion about Miami, <clears throat> like launching itself as a world class city and also financially viable. Uh, you know, where you've got like, a group that also controls the family collection, but it's really putting themselves out there. And, uh, you know, I, I see people like you who are working. Been either a credit or in the institutions, really put pressure on them to step up and become more of a public persona. Because really, um, the weight of their choices make open their collections up and basically promote the arts, but also promote their own collections. And I think there is much more weight than, uh, you know, I mean, individual certain amount that man, you know, when the Shoals or the, when the Rubel family collection opens up their, you know, their home museum, it's like there's your 3,000 people. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. exactly. Yeah, yeah, and I think that, I think that in, in the near future, five years, we'll probably see a Jordan Snitzer yeah. museum of prints here in Portland. I mean, yeah. like, we might as well just say names. Like, I know there's this dance around us. Yeah. But no, yeah, I, I, I agree with you and uh, and you know 
know, that, that's, you know, coming from, you know, a, a different scene, you know, because like I'm an implant in the program, I've seen, you know, I've been here for 25 years, but I, I, I've been somewhere else for more than that. So I've seen all the things, you know, and uh, com coming from that, you know, like what I see that is missing here is exactly that, you know, like having an opportunity, you know, for this local scene to raise, because there is other things that are happening simultaneously within the scene to help it sort of grow and bring people in, you know, and uh, and that's why I'm hoping that one day we can we can have like some huge event that, that would do that, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, we tried the Portland District Biennale, but it's a Biennale for the locals, you know, and we tried the Jupiter Festival, and it was more of like bringing galleries in town to sell work and who's gonna buy them, you know. But I think just having an opportunity to get money and uh, bring artists to show uh, who are who don't have access to the United States, to Portland, to show work and having people in the United States traveling to Portland to see it yeah. would be a great opportunity. Yeah. We, we do have a yeah. moment that we need to seize here. There's certainly, we're in the news, we're in the news cycle. We have New York and Los Angeles' media centers working for us at the moment. And I think part of the reason I wanted to convene this is because it's, it's a moment to go and uh, uh, make good on some of the promises that are out there. I think then maybe we're really quick about an action item that I would love to see us yes. uh, uh, take forward would be to have another something like this that isn't so one table audience that is much more in the round where we really just dig into Moja's idea of bringing around bringing about some sort of BNL, some sort of international thing, where we have the spaces and the people and maybe even a few of the funders at this very public event where we can really air out our dirty laundry, air out our emotions, and really then clear the space to make something happen. I absolutely agree. And I'm sorry the space is so narrow. It no, might not be, no, it might not be round enough for that event. No, yeah, yeah. But I think that's, that's, I think that's brilliant. You talk like this all the time. That's absolutely yeah. I think yeah. it needs to be. Yeah, it needs to be. We need the follow through piece, speaking of follow through. Exactly. We have a conversation going, because we'll all have ideas leaving here. Like, oh, I wish I thought of that. And if we have it's like a primary conversation, we'll get to the next place. And, and have that expectation that we can talk amongst each other this way. And honestly, you know, I know a lot of these collectors and, and patrons, they're open to talking. It, it's not like, the, what's interesting about Portland is people are quite open. It's not as close as many places. You can actually call up somebody who's worth over a billion dollars and get them on the phone and you're like, what just happened here? Because you can't do that in Chicago. A secretary or a, uh, and you, you know, you're, just, you're just trying to get a meeting with somebody's assistant. I think we can build models where we don't have to worry about calling this Exactly. That's I true. agree. But I also agree that we need this concise sort of dialogue. Like, we need a direction. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think there was an Occupy Portland movement well before the Occupy movement. <laughs> I think the artists occupied Portland. And we've helped make this place more interesting. And Maybe we just sort of place our demands. Because honestly, it's the squeaky wheel that gets oil. And there's oil. Thank you so much. I would like to thank Jane for thank you. Thank you so much for hosting us. Thank you.